Hi, George Hepworth, Grover Park Consulting. Let's build Mike's mobile library. Today, I just want to wrap up all of the things that I learned, all the lessons that I acquired by taking the original production version of the Power Apps application called Mike's Mobile Library and creating a new development copy from that uh, with the idea that once I have that development copy in place, I can go ahead and use it to experiment with new features, new ideas, change things, try things out, make improvements, and so on, uh, without touching the production application, which will go forward and I will use it. Uh, at the end of that process, I actually deleted the original production application, copied the development version that I had finished up to that point, renamed it production, and now it will go forward as the current active production uh, version of Mike's Mobile Library. That's sort of similar to what you would do in a regular uh, software development life, life cycle uh, process. I did it in reverse, but going forward we will now follow the more traditional pattern. In today's session, I just want to kind of wrap up what I learned in that process. One of the questions I'd like to address is, was it worth it? Did I uh, feel like the end result was something that I could actually use uh, on a regular basis, maybe not day to day, but on a regular basis, will I be able to use this Power Apps application as an extension of my desktop access version of that original database application? Does it have features that make it valuable enough to put the effort into creating it uh, so that I have this hybrid with the desktop and the mobile versions together? Was it worth it? And would I do this all the same way again? I think I can say without any hesitation that it was definitely worth it. I can do things with mobile version that are difficult at best with the desktop version. Particular, the, the most obvious one is using the camera in my phone to take pictures to add to the library as images of the covers of the books. I couldn't do that. Uh, with the desktop version at all. I suppose I could, but it would be, I can't even imagine how I would go about doing it, really. And the answer to the question, would I do it the same way again, is partly yes and partly no. Along the way, I was learning. So yes, I would do that exploration process the same way. I would try things out, find out what worked, what didn't, uh, implement new ideas as they came to them or as they came to me. Uh, some things I would not do the same way again, and I'll explain those in a minute. Oops, went too far. First of all, uh, I think the Power Apps is a great way to fill the need for hybrid apps. We have had a long history of desktop relational database applications built with access as the front end interface. And for a long time, we have used various uh, data sources, SQL Server, SharePoint, uh, other data, other server-based databases like uh, MySQL or, or uh, even Oracle uh, as backends to our databases. But uh, essentially, the, uh, the interface has been on the desktop. In Windows. Uh, we now have the ability to connect that with a mobile app that runs on the cell phone or in the browser or a tablet and extend that basic data into a new interface that frees us from the desktop. What's good about Power Apps? Well, obviously the mobile aspect. They run in the browser. They run in, as I just got through saying, most if not all mobile devices, all standard browsers. And it's coming soon to the Windows desktop. There is a preview, I have a preview version. I have it installed on my computer, which allows you to play 
the Power Apps. It is not a development environment. It's purely a player environment. But it runs on the desktop as well as uh, uh, in the browser. And of course, we have the ability to create with Power Apps a responsive UI. Uh, in, the mo in its most simple terms, it runs either landscape or portrait view and uh, responds to the format of the device on which you're working. Another good thing about Power Apps is that it is an essentially a low-code environment. Uh, one of one aspect of that is the is that it uh, relies heavily on what are called declarative statements as opposed to imperative commands that we're used to in the access development world. Uh, in a declarative statement, we simply tell the Power Apps application what needs to be done, but we don't tell it when to do it or how to do it. We simply say, this needs to happen. You figure out when to make it happen. Uh, for example, a very simple example would be whether or not a, a label on this particular screen from Access World, a label on a form, is visible or not. The uh, declarative statement is the visible property of that label is equal to a variable. And that variable can be true or false. What happens is that any time the value of that variable changes, Power Apps responds, this label responds on this screen, this label on this screen responds to become visible or invisible with no command issued. It simply watches that variable and if its state changes, it responds. Let me illustrate that. I set up a demonstration here um, in the access interface to this same application to illustrate the idea behind a, an imperative command. And this is very, very phony because nobody would ever do this, I don't think. But to illustrate the point of the, of the, of the, the label being visible or invisible, we have a form with four controls on it for the creator ID, first name, last name, middle name, and four labels associated with those. We have events, and when these events fire, they cause things to happen. That's the imperative approach. This event causes something to happen. So the two events that I chose for the illustration are when this field gets the focus and when it loses focus. And the command, the imperative command is, when that control gets focus, show its label. When that control loses focus, hide its label. And if we run the form, and it starts out, and of course you can see the cursor is sitting in that first control, and the label to the left is visible. If I move focus into the second control, then that event fires. That firing of that event causes that label to go invisible. This is very different in concept, although it doesn't really appear all that different, uh, perhaps, with the declarative statement. The declarative statement simply says, watch this field, or watch this variable. When it's true, hide, show the control. When it's false, hide the control. No event has to happen. Well, I guess there is an event that does have to happen, and that is that variable changes its value. But in response to that change in the variable, this happens automatically. We don't have to go to that control and fire the event associated with it, in this case, got focus or lost focus, in order for it to happen. That control is sitting there watching, 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 and when that variable changes, it responds. That's the idea of declarative statements. Let me repeat that a little differently. Uh, the idea of the declarative statement, as we said, is that it tells this Power Apps application what needs to be done. This label needs to either be visible or not visible. But we don't tell it when to do it or how to do it. All we do is say, if this variable is true, make the, the control view true. And you just watch that variable, and, and when it changes, you respond.
I hope that's an accurate enough picture of, of the difference between imperative and, and declarative statements to, to, uh, to make sense and, and to be reasonably accurate. The, the, the interesting thing to me is that it really required me to think differently about how I wanted to make things happen. Simply say, this needs to happen, but not to go in and directly force it to happen. And that's a very different kind of mindset from, from what I had as an access developer. Oops, and I keep doing that. Now, Power Apps are low code, but they are not no code. You do have to write code, as we just saw. There was that was that line is is a bit of code, but for experienced developers, uh, there are very familiar concepts and methods. Uh, you will not find that Power Apps requires you to learn a whole new set of uh, ideas, logic. Uh, for example, there are if statements and lookups in Power Apps. The syntax differs, but the logic behind them doesn't. And as I say, once you get more comfortable with the environment in which we're working, many of these things will simply pop out at you as I need to do this. There's got to be a code or a function, an action that corresponds to what I would probably do in Access, and I'll just figure out what that is. I need a lookup. And there is a lookup that works very similarly. A syntax slightly different, but close enough for you to just automatically know that I need that the lookup is going to work this way. The logic behind it is going to work that way. Another good thing I discovered is that uh, Power Apps is a constantly evolving ecosystem. It's it's relatively new. It's now six years old and fairly mature. But because it's a new, growing, evolving ecosystem, new features are implemented regularly. And you, you will find this is, there are pluses and minuses to this, but it's mostly pluses. Uh, most of the new features as they come out are going to be uh, improvements or ways to accomplish things that you felt frustrated or limited by in the past. Uh, and uh, that's happening all the time uh, in the course of working on this series of videos, I can think of at least two that, that were uh, released in that period of time that I was able to take advantage of immediately. And the second thing is that there is now a robust community of developers. There are Power Apps developers who have been doing this long enough, four or five, six years now, that uh, there is a Power Apps developers community on which you can draw for information uh, and assistance along the, those same lines uh, there is an enormous number of connections and linkages for example at this point uh, I believe the list is over 150 connectors uh, to other to data sources uh, including the big three, what I refer to as the big three, SharePoint lists, SQL Azure or SQL Server, and Dataverse. Now there are, like I say, 150 more. Uh, some of them are relatively obscure. Some of them you would recognize if you saw the name, although you wouldn't necessarily think of it as a, a data source coming from the access world. But, but Power Apps is able to connect to and use data from an enormous variety of sources. So that's constantly expanding as well. Online documentation and support. And again, um, in the last six years, five years, six years, I, I'm not sure how exactly how long Power Apps has actually been available. Uh, to my knowledge, about six years, seven years maybe. Uh, there's now a substantial forum environment out there, places where you can go and ask questions and, and know that those that cadre of experienced Power Apps developers are going to be there to address your questions. You're not going to be 
a voice crying in the wilderness. Uh, there are some YouTube playlists, and I've referred to a, two or three of them in, in the videos I made uh, in, in the course of this this project. Uh, in particular, uh, Shane Young, Reza Durrani, uh, uh, Matthew Devaney, and there's one more who's Daniel Christian, who, whose name. Uh, who, who, you know, those those folks are making really high quality training videos, uh, and they're all found on YouTube. And of course, there's the Microsoft documentation, which is now pretty mature and pretty pretty good. So you're going to find the help you need. What's bad about Power Apps? Well, rapid growth it means a certain degree of unpredictability. It's hard to know when something will change, and impossible to predict how it might change. You know, just as you. Just as I said, you know, there, there's constantly new developments. Well, some things that you had relied on uh, might break because that's been changed or deprecated. Uh, we're aware over the course of history of Microsoft Access, of course, of breaking changes. So that's nothing new. But, but uh, th there is a certain level of unpredictability about the kinds of breaking changes that you'll see in Power Apps very occasionally, but they still happen. One of the major things that I found to be a drawback in working with Power Apps, and it's not specific to Power Apps itself, but that the native record storage, the way, you know, the kind of the, 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 the standard approach it, to using a, a record storage service is SharePoint lists. Power Apps runs in SharePoint, SharePoint lists run in SharePoint, so there's this natural connection. And they work quite well together. However, in terms of making a relational database application, SharePoint lists are, shall we say, idiosyncratic. Uh, and those of you who are Access developers know what I mean by uh, the, the, the shortcomings of SharePoint lists. Uh, despite being native, to this same development environment, uh, I found that they are harder to manage than just a, a SQL Server uh, database tables. Uh, I'm, I'm, I don't know how else to put that other than to say that if I have a choice between a SharePoint list and a SQL Server table, I'm going to be a lot more comfortable with the structure of a SQL Server table and know how to work with it effectively. So in the future, if I were to uh, be called on to develop a Power Apps application for a client, I would look first to either SQL Server, SQL, SQL Azure, depending on their preference, and then Dataverse. Dataverse for an Access developer is still relatively new, and for that reason, primarily, you simply don't know enough about them, about the Dataverse environment to recommend it, but it's certainly uh, something that I would consider to be prefer preferable to SharePoint lists. Development lifecycle management. This is uh, not Power Apps' strong point, especially if you're working with SharePoint lists. There is practically no good way <laughs> I, to, to, to do development lifecycle management with, with SharePoint lists. Uh, uh, Luke Chung at, at FMS recently had a discussion in one of the user in one of the groups that I participate in, where where he was ha he was trying to figure out how to make that happen, and, and finally found a way to to implement something that would work, but it was not uh, an intuitive and kind of uh, how do I put this? It was not an intuitive kind of approach that you would expect. Uh, coming from the relational database application world. What's next for me in Power Apps? Well, I have a completed application in production. I have a completed application in development. From now on, I will continue to develop only in the development version, and I will continue to use the production version for production. I'm going to complete my catalog of library books. I think at this point I have 
roughly 70, 71, 72 books that I've entered into my catalog of library books uh, during the building and testing of this uh, Power Apps application, Mike's Mobile Library, and I will continue to work on that as I uh, find time, and I'll eventually have a catalog of all of my library books uh, completed and ready to go. And in the meantime, I'm recruiting or hoping to recruit at least one beta tester uh, to uh, try out what I have and see if it really works uh, for them as well as it does for me, or, or maybe better or not, a, not at all. Uh, my, my idea there is to find somebody who has a small catalog and see if they can make it work. Uh, and that brings me to the final point, which is cost. Uh, and, I, and I've really not talked about cost very much, but that, that is a factor. Uh, for, for example, I have the version of uh, Power Apps where I pay, I believe it is roughly $20 a month for the apps that I work with. So it's $20 per month per user is the way that comes out. So I can have multiple apps. There are other ways to uh, license Power Apps uh, per app, per user, per month, which is, of course, a lower cost per app. But as you add more apps, you know, it, it adds up. And I, and I think I'll avoid uh, pricing entirely because, for one thing, uh, it's going to vary with whatever your needs are. And uh, rather than commit to, uh, you know, the, the video, these pricing, I, I refer you to whatever is current at the time you're, you're ready to start working with Power Apps and find the, the pricing model that works best for you. So that's it for Mike's mobile library. We're done. We've got it ready to go. We're working on it. I hope that through this journey you have found something worthwhile and useful to yourself. I hope that you do try Power Apps. I think it is a very powerful extension of our data into a more mobile environment. And Access developers, we've always had uh, a very strong, probably the strongest desktop application in in access but in order to uh, take advantage of what's coming and it's what's already here in, in a lot of ways which is the mobile environment the the smartphones the the browsers the tablets we need to have a way to extend our applications into that environment and i think power apps power apps can be that solution so Subscribe, and as I come back at some point, hopefully in the near future, with new installments of different versions of uh, the work I'm doing with Power Apps, uh, you'll get notification. And uh, hit the like button, which tells me that you're finding something useful. See, see you in the near future. Thank you.